This is the second lecture on Midsummer Night's Dream called The World of Midsummer Night's Dream. And in this, I'll talk a little bit about the setting as well as the social and cultural background, the context, and where Shakespeare's drawing some of these ideas from. There will be some repetition and overlap with the other lectures, but this is largely going to focus on that cultural background, a little bit of the characters, and a little bit of the plot as well. The first thing to note is that this play is set in ancient Greece, which was a very important time for the Renaissance, the culture of the Renaissance. They very much valued the world of ancient Greece as the pinnacle of civilization, and it was the time of epic tales. This is the world of heroes and monsters, of gods and goddesses walking the earth, and of tragic loves and deaths. So that's the world that's sort of in the background to this whole play. And the play begins in Athens, which is sort of the jewel of ancient Greek civilization, as far as uh, many people in the Renaissance were concerned. And this is the city of democracy and the city of great philosophers. Um, and that is where Theseus is king and where he is returning triumphantly after battle at the beginning of the play. If you're not familiar with Theseus, he's a very important figure in Greek mythology one of the kings of Athens, uh, possibly of divine, having divine heritage. He's reputed to have been the son of the, the god of the sea, Poseidon. Uh, also related to Hercules, another very famous figure in Greek mythology. Theseus is most famous in stories for negotiating the labyrinth and de defeating the monstrous Minotaur who lived within. And he had multiple lovers throughout his life, including Hippolyta, whom he marries at the end of Midsummer. Uh, but he has other lovers and other wives after Hippolyta, even. Now, Hippolyta, whom Theseus has just defeated in battle, was queen of the Amazons. The Amazons, you've probably heard of. They are a mythological society of female warriors. Uh, there are debates, I believe, as to whether or not there were real matriarchal societies like the Amazons, but really for our concerns, what's more important is the myth of the Amazons. Uh, and in the Renaissance, they, they were associated with a lot of different ideas. They were, um, on the one hand, venerated for their great martial abilities. They were considered to be great warriors, but they were also um, associated with very disturbing myths of self-mutilation and castration. So they were reputed to uh, remove one of their own breasts to make it easier to fire a bow and arrow, and they were also reputed to mutilate the bodies of their uh, any male children that they had, um, either dis uh, making them disabled or, in fact, even killing them or just casting them out altogether. So the Amazons were a very complex figure in Renaissance uh, thought, a very complex mythological figure, again, both um, impressive, thought to be impressive and valued for their great uh, martial abilities, but also feared and associated with a very disturbing world where things are backwards, where women are on top and men are uh, mutilated as a result. One last important element in Midsummer that, that comes from this ancient Greek world, uh, actually from ancient Rome, is the story of Pyramus and Thisbe. Um, and this is a story, a tragic story of forbidden love, a uh, young man and woman who uh, are unable to express their love for each other because of their parents' rivalry. And um, due to a misunderstanding, they, of course, both end up dying. Uh, if this sounds familiar, it's because Shakespeare would take this basic plot and use it in Romeo and Juliet, a play that he wrote at roughly the same time as Midsummer Night's Dream. Uh, Pyramus and Thisbe first comes from Ovid, who is a Roman Latin poet, uh, but it's, it's set in the same sort of mythological world of ancient Greek and ancient Roman um, gods and goddesses. So this is the story, of course, that the rude mechanicals, that the play uh, the players the actors who are all tradesmen not professional actors they are laborers day laborers this is the play that they perform very badly at the end of midsummer and again it is a tragic love story parallels very closely romeo and juliet but also parallels in a dark way the story of the lovers in a midsummer night's dream <sighs> Thank you. 
alongside this mythological world of ancient Greece, there's also Shakespeare's contemporary rural England. This life and this world is also invoked in A Midsummer Night's Dream. This is a world of farming and pastures, people who raise crops for a living, uh, usually on land owned by other people, perhaps if they're lucky, on some small bit of land for themselves, people who raise livestock, uh, people who live in small villages, not the bustling cosmopolitan city of London, but small villages where everyone knows everyone, where there's not much new going on, where growth and change are slow. This is a world of folk traditions and its own mythology, which I'll talk about, things that inform it alongside the Greek myths, but European traditions, pagan traditions that still existed in Shakespeare's world, but also very important uh, economic concerns and day-to-day and -day concerns like the frequent famines and crop shortages that many people in England suffered from and people died from on a regular basis. And also the economic controversy of enclosure in which more and more land that had been given over to public and community farming was being enclosed to be used by sheep owners and people who raised sheep, uh, which was a very profitable enterprise. So there's that competition between these new markets and traditional ways of life and people whose economic way of life was being crowded out by bigger businesses. So those concerns are also there in some of the language that we see and the characters that we see in A Midsummer Night's Dream. One very important folk tradition that's clearly invoked by the title of Shakespeare's play is Midsummer Festival, a celebration of the summer solstice in which communities got together to celebrate nature, dance, sing, uh, share food, uh, play games, all sorts of things like that. So it was a community event. Um, and the summer solstice celebration went back many centuries. It's an old tradition in uh, pagan tradition in European uh, folk religions. Um, in the Christian calendar, it became the Feast of John the Baptist on June 24th. And this folk aspect of it was suppressed by Protestants in the 16th century who did not like the rituals that went back to these old religions. They associated this with idolatry, um, with paganism, and they tried to suppress it and keep it down, even though it did still remain and still exists to this day in rural England. A closely related celebration in folk tradition is May Day, May 1st, which again is an old folk or pagan celebration, uh, much like the Midsummer Festival that celebrates nature, communities get together, dance and sing, um, and in particular the center of the of the uh, May Day celebration is the May Pole, which they have these very colored banners that they dance around, and it makes a very beautiful sight. Um, and these are celebrations of nature, celebrations of uh, renewal. They're meant to bring the community together. They're meant to ward off evil spirits. They are meant to um, celebrate fertility and renewal and the changing of the seasons and all these sorts of things. Much like Midsummer Fest, May Day became um, Christianized, and so in the Christian calendar, May Day is the day of Pentecost, or what's called Whitsun in England. And that is the day that the Holy Spirit descended upon the apostles um, 50 days after the death and resurrection and um, ascension of Christ. So that's the in the Christian ideology, in the Christian story, that's what's celebrated on May Day. And again, this May pole dance is at the center of it. And there's a May Queen who you can see on the left in the bottom of the left uh, image there, who is the usually a village beauty who is made queen of the celebration. It's sort of like being prom queen. It's usually a young woman um, who is named May Queen. And so it's a, again, it's a celebration. It's a community organization, much like Midsummer. It was suppressed by Protestants who did not like not the Pentecost or Whitsun part of it, but the the Maypole itself and the folk and pagan aspects of it. Protestants tried to suppress this and um, uh, keep the people from performing this because they associated with it with idolatry and false religion. Although again, it still exists even today as a 
um, community celebration and and a historical recreation. Uh, interestingly, interestingly enough, in the 19th century, May 1st became the International Workers' Day, adopted by um, the early socialist and communist movements. And of course, that's something that Shakespeare could not know about, but it's an interesting coincidence given the presence of our laborers, our workers, Bottom and the others, in this play. The fairies of Midsummer Night's Dream, one of the most famous and beloved elements of the play, were another aspect of Shakespeare's rural England and its folk traditions that he brought to his story. Uh, in folk traditions, these could be little household or woodland spirits. They were considered variously helpful and or mischievous. They could be helpful one day, and if you got irritated, if they got irritated with you, they'd be uh, cause you problems the next day. So the fairies were the little things that stole your socks or put a hole in the bottom of your bowl or made you slip off your seat, all things that Puck talks about doing. Um, in Christian thought, Christian pastors and teachers didn't really like people believing in the fairies. They didn't like this relic of pagan belief. They uh, So they tried to associate fairies with witchcraft and demonic spirits as a way to get people to not think about them or, or just find them distasteful. Um, and in fact, King James, in his work on demonology, talks about fairies and, and associates them with witches. Uh, and one of the most famous and interesting myths associated with fairies that's important for understanding Midsummer is the idea of changelings. Changelings were the little children. Uh, fairies were reputed to kidnap human children and then leave little fairy elf children in their place. Um, and so, of course, at the center of Oberon and Titania's fight is the little changeling Indian boy that uh, Oberon wants and Titania will not give to him. So the fairies are also, they have this weird association with children, with childbirth, uh, with replacing children, and with this idea of you know, not knowing who your child is. Uh, it could be not your own child, but a little fairy child that um, was left there while your child's off in magic land. And another interesting topic that this brings up is it allows us to see how Shakespeare uses these overlapping cultures. And it's not that any one is the root meaning. It's not that, for example, um, everything should be reduced down to a Christian meaning, uh, a Christian allegory, but rather that he's drawing from these different sources to create his own world. So we have ancient Greece, the height of civilization and learning. And then we have the Christian, uh, that is the traditional Christian or Catholic tradition of saints' days, um, days like St. John the Baptist. Uh, we have the rural and folk traditions uh, like the Maypole and Midsummer's Day and so forth. And that's a very interesting one because it can go back even further. Another layer perhaps that we might add on, one of the most popular um, and common events at these sort of festivals is a form of dancing called Morris dancing. And the name Morris comes from short for Moorish, that is the Moors, or the um, African Islamic peoples, people of North Africa uh, of uh, the Islamic religion. So this very traditional medieval English dance is itself based on Islamic traditions. So that's a whole nother layer of culture that, that is possibly being referenced in this text. And then, of course, we have the Protestant reinterpretation of all of these stories and these myths, the way the Protestants reinterpreted the Catholic stories and, and reinterpreted and suppressed the rural and folk traditions. And then finally, we have contemporary life, that is Shakespeare's contemporary life, the concerns with famine, the concerns with enclosure, the concerns of workers like Bottom and his friends who are just trying to get by, trying to get enough money to live their lives. So all of these different elements are going into the play, and we might ask ourselves, how do they all combine? What do we get? What, how do they inform each other? So just a couple of thoughts on what thinking about the world and the setting of the play can do for us. Uh, to put it in dialogue with the plot, we can come up with a very simple uh, but useful framework to help us understand at least some of the ideas that looking at the world can, can give us. So the, the play moves from Athens 
into the forest and then back to Athens again. Um, but this world of Athens at the beginning is very rigid, whereas the world of, Rat of Athens at the end has been softened. Those so hard edges have been softened. And that is because of that passing through the forest, which is both a natural forest, but also a forest of super nature, of the supernatural. And so alongside this plot of Athens to forest to Athens is a plot of love thwarted at the beginning, Hermia and uh, Lysander cannot be together because of her father's op opposition to the marriage. In the world of the forest, there's chaos, transformation, and renewal. And then we come out to a world where love is fulfilled, where the couples can be married as they wish. And again, that's a simple framework, but it is helpful. Um, however, we might question, as I will in a moment, just how fulfilled is love at the end? Have the hard edges of Athens really been softened by this transformative journey through the green world of the forest? And that is, in fact, the basis of the question, the first question that I've given here as a final thought. How do these different cultural sources, the English sources, the English ideas, the Christian ideas, the ancient Greek and Roman ideas, how do they suggest different themes in the play? How do they create different meaning in, meanings in the play? So, for example, Pentecost uh, in Christianity is a day that celebrates this idea of inspiration of the Holy Spirit descending onto the apostles and the ability to speak in tongues. Um, yet we have a very different sort of transformation and inspiration going on in this play. The magic that happens to the men in the forest, the transformation of bottom and the kinds of truths that he speaks. So how does that inform things? And we could put that alongside, for example, stories of Theseus who defeats what? The Minotaur? A human with a with an animal with a bull's head um, that idea of the mix between human and animal which is sort of monstrous and frightening but also very appealing in another way um, very very fascinating in a strange way so what are the different meanings that are created when we draw from these different sources and then to go back to the issue of plot what problems remained unsolved at the end of the play is the love story are the various love stories that are going on so simply uh, resolved are they are they going to be happy marriages um, or are there things that might trouble us that make us think that this resolution is a little neat uh, that it ignores certain problems and then finally how would you update or adapt the play if you would? Um, would you change the settings to a more modern setting? Would you keep it in ancient Greece and the forest? Or would you try to make these in some way different or new? Try to make them um, appeal to a modern audience in a new way? So these are just a few questions to think about when thinking about the world of A Midsummer Night's Dream. And I'll have some more questions and more ideas in future video lectures. So the next video will be A Midsummer Night's Dream, Plots, and then Midsummer Moon, Tracing an Image. Again, the plots, of course, we'll discuss the different plot lines and how they interact. And Midsummer Moon is a follow-up to last week's writing assignment, where I show you how you can use the Shakespeare Concordance to trace how an image develops throughout the play.